Hello, Lionesses. This is Bobby Carlton. I am the editor-in-chief and publisher of Lioness Magazine. I'm also the founder of Innovation Women. And today I'm super excited. We have the founder and CEO of BoardWise with us. Dr. Donna Hamlin is committed to identifying ways to improve governance practices and results for companies around the world. Donna, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. So great to have you here. I I have to admit, I was very excited to get you in the hot seat because (laughs) boards, like all these meetings, they're behind closed doors and it's always one of those things. It's slightly mysterious and also obviously very interesting. And so important for entrepreneurs to understand. So whether it's an advisory board for a startup, the board of a funded company, often investors, or the board of directors for a public company, they, they are so much guidance and wisdom and important access to outside perspective, you know, and knowledge. So how did you get involved in this incredibly exciting area? Well, you know, it's funny. The first professional job I had was at General Electric. And I was an employee communication specialist at the time. And I got invited to one of their big events where communication specialists from all over were invited. And during that day, they brought forward their new director on their board. And it was the first woman director for the company. And it was at a time when it was a breakthrough to do anything like that. And she gave a speech and I was 23 sitting there thinking, this is a big deal. I got to pay attention to this. And I started taking a look at what was going on with boards and governance and you know, having this woman here, maybe that could be me too someday. And I started researching and I went and got myself certified at 24 years old. Wow. That's not, that's early. not imagining that I do anything early, but it's so important to understand how that works in the organization. And it just makes you a better executive. And as time goes by, you, you're better charged for whatever you might do in the future, even if you don't think you're going to get on the board for a while. So your company, BoardWise, tell us about that. You're providing advice, research, consulting. Yeah, tell us what have, you do. We have several um, legs on the stool. First, we're looking at the best practices and governance around the globe so that companies who are looking to improve what they're doing have one place to go where the research is there. And the issue with governance is that many countries are different different in their regulatory bodies. And so there's no right answer. It depends on where you sit. And most of the companies after the banks had their collapses started experimenting with different techniques. And it takes five, six years before you can see if those matter. So we're looking to see which ones actually have stickiness. Mm. So that's one. We also do board evaluations for companies that would like a third party to take a look at how well they're doing. And then we do certification and education for people who would like to serve on boards or for those that have to have continuing education to stay on boards. It's not the same in every country. Here in the U.S., it's considered a good thing to do. But in Europe, you have to have 40 hours of continuing education every year. And if you go to Australia, you have to be certified before you can accept the position. So it depends on where you're you're being invited, so to speak. And then we place candidates. There's no requirements in the U.S. for education or certification? There's a specialty requirement for people who are in the audit committee for public companies, but otherwise it's just considered uh, probably a good thing to do. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so we are seeing diversity and gender equity requirements starting to pop up. Um, different countries, states, regulatory organizations, even some investors are starting to make demands about board makeup. What are some of those requirements? Yeah, it's a hot topic. And it's not just US, it's all over the globe. 
And it's coming from two directions. One is just social justice. There's enough push right now on what's mm -hmm. rightful and diversity and inclusion are hot topics. So everybody's looking at it with that in mind. The other is that there's a lot of data now that's showing that those organizations that create diversity on the board outperform the ones that don't. That's an ROI factor and you can't, you can't avoid the math of that. No matter what country is looking at it, it keeps coming up the same way. Oops, diversity makes a difference. So it's, it's popular for, for both rational reasons as well as just moral reasons, if you want to put it in that category. So it's a great time for people to start looking at it. But the trick with that is not the diversity as much as it is the inclusion. Mm, when you look at creating difference around the table, I mean, Trudeau says it, diversity is a fact. And inclusion, he says, is a choice. Now, I would argue it's a competency. When you put people around the table and they come from different approaches or different philosophies or different experiences, you have to create a way to honor and respect that uh, difference of voice and take it all in. And if you don't have the gifts or the competencies for that, you usually get a lot of frustration and intolerance or you know subsets that start to duke it out and that doesn't work. So a lot of our work is to create good dynamics around the table when you've got diversity and you want diversity of thought. That's where the best ideas float to the top. If you have, at least what I say, everybody thinks alike around a table, you don't have a board, you have a party. Everybody gets along, you're having a great time. They all agree, they can all have a beer. But if you really have diversity of thought, you have to have the patience to hear each other out to figure out where those new ideas might make it a better decision than not. We know that those groups that do it outperform the ones that don't. So can you train up for inclusion skills or can you bring people in who are emotionally intelligent enough to have them already? That's a screening mechanism that's really important. Hmm. So um, back to that requirements thing. I know, for example, California is requiring yep. uh, is it at least one woman on a board. Well, it depends on the size. Okay. It, it can go up to two. And then New York now has uh, a law that's requiring it. I'm working with a company right now that they have to add a diversity candidate. Um, Michigan has passed some. Now, there, some of them are regulatory, as in you really have to do it. And others are because the states are choosing to create a report of audit for how well the state is doing in that. So then you have to file a lot of paperwork with your justifications as to whether you have or haven't complied with this. And it, it doesn't mean that you get you're getting punished yet. It's just that you're under a hot light. And so it's something to be sensitive to state to state unless you are going on principle-based thinking, which means that you want to do it because it's the right thing to do. And then you're not subject to compliance. You're just doing it because you, you should. And in California, when that launched, there was all kinds of hoo-ha-ha in the news about companies are going to file suits against that and they're going to fight it. And it didn't really happen. I think there was one case of a group in LA. Everybody else just said, okay, then let's do it. And, you know, I'm not a big advocate for that sort of forced busing kind of approach to, to change, but darn it, it works. <laughs> so we might as well take advantage of it while we've got it here and do the right thing. Now, it doesn't mean that me, especially as an advocate for this, would say diversity is an opportunity. Now, make yourself armed for success, because if you just get put in a chair, and you haven't been armed to do that job well, it's a blowback for all the other candidates. So I'm a strong advocate to make sure that you are prepared because then you stand tall and every other person that's a candidate will also be honored because of that. Interesting. So it, are those regulations actually making a dent in the equity numbers? Well, they are, and the trends are interesting. And if you compare the U.S. to some of the other countries, we're still behind, but we're catching a trend now of improvement, which is directionally right. 
So I think we're going to find ourselves in a much better state in the next couple of years. Oh, and it, that diversity is more spectrum than just women and men. We're looking at diversity and a broader explanation of it. Although Canada has the most profound definition of diversity because they've included the ethnicity, the native original uh, people, they've got disabilities factored in and the compliance is regulatory. It's not philosophical. Interesting. So if you want to watch it really unfold, Canada is the place to look. All right. So you are working both with individuals and with companies. Are you matchmaking? And yes, I'm- we are. <laughs> <laughs> we are doing a great job with matchmaking and it just keeps getting smarter and smarter the more you know people that get involved. I had a gentleman from Canada who was referred because he was trying to get two directors for his two boards. He wanted two women. And he was in the um, early R&D stage for cancer solutions. And he said, I've tried six months to try and, try and find candidates for both those boards. And I'm talking to him and looking into our database at the same time and taking the specs. And I said, well, I have nine for you. And he just about dropped his coffee. And I sent them over and he interviewed all nine and he called me and said, I'd like to hire all nine. And, and it's because people who are progressive thinkers and are professionally oriented want to be found for the right reasons. And we have a profiling system that we use where people have to fill out all kinds of information, not only about their experience and their qualifications, but their preferences. And we do a psychometric model to look at how they solve problems. Mm-hmm. And we're interested in diversity of thought. So we want to understand that too. And we can match really well now with what people are looking for in short order. And anybody that's listening who's interested in being part of that can do that so that they can be a candidate if they're interested in board work. And I bring that up specifically because we also know in our research that um, CEOs, even if it's an early stage company, become a better CEO if they serve on somebody else's board as well. And the reason is because they start to understand both sides of the table better and it makes them a better executive as well as a good director. Interesting. So I talked to a lot of first time CEOs and I think a lot of them feel like like I do. It's a little uneasy about having a board. It's like, you know, you went into business to be your own boss and suddenly I've got a whole group of bosses. You know, I, how do I get the most out of my board and how do I get the board to help me accelerate my company's growth? Well, first we do know from all the research that the sooner you set that infrastructure up, the faster your acceleration rate And the mistake that many early stage companies do is wait too long and then they start to build it out. My golden rule is the minute you take somebody else's check, get a board Mm -hmm. because you want that for protection more than anything else as a starter. Now, what happens is that first time CEOs oftentimes don't understand how to leverage a board and they don't quite understand the role. And I just, I'm on a board right now with a, a gentleman who came out of Goldman Sachs and He's got on his board mostly in investors. I'm the independent director and he'll call and he'll ask me some questions and he'll say, you know, I ask you that because all the other ones, I just, can I just tell you the truth? I just think of them as wallets and, and I, I'm going to call them when I want more money or I have access to a resource, but I want to call you to talk about real strategy. And the mistake there is that they're more than just wallets. Oftentimes they have a conflict of interest because they've got their money in it and they've got representation, but you really should look for guidance from your board directors. Uh, You should first screen them and make sure that they're going to be aligned with the push of what you're trying to do. They're not there for other reasons. Um, Make sure that they do have, and you can reach out to them for access to resources But what you're really looking for is for them to ask questions that give you alternative ways of thinking about solving the problems that you have on the plate. And they should be accessible to you between the board meetings for that sort of thinking together. You should treat them like coaches almost. 
And they have a duty to inquire about what's going on so that they can help you think better. So one thing is a good CEO has to do is make sure that people that are reporting to you or in the company understand when a director calls, it's their job to find out certain information. So give it to them. Don't think of it as a go around the CEO. Or it's the way that you actually enable the value of encouraging quality debate and then exploring viewpoints so that you get better decisions than if it was just you. The reason boards exist is because companies realize that you can't have a sun king, which is what a CEO all by him or herself is. The decisions of a sun king often are weak. They feel righteous, but they're not as good as if you put thought around the table. Very interesting. So, you know, using that, I mean, there's some tricks that CEOs should do too. It's um, CEO should not also be the board chair because that's conflicted. Mm -hmm. And it should be really important that when you're considering candidates to join the board, that you make sure that they're clear that their orientation and understanding matches yours as to whether you are on a growth path or a profitability path. Because the dis design of where you're gonna go has to be aligned with everybody understanding that. The board is supposed to be there to make you successful. That's their duty. And that duty of loyalty is above and beyond their own interests as investors. So if, if a CEO actually understands these conflicts exist and then they screen right and they know what they can get out of the leverage of the value of that, then it's, it's really good. And that's, that's the board itself. And then the advisory board is there to be a kitchen cabinet to you. It's there to help you strengthen the way you manage within the operations. And you know, many people who take on the CEO title are really gifted in a certain area, but they want surround sound skills. And that's what an advisory board does. It helps you become a top-notch performer in the business. That's great. What about being on the board? Is that something that we should all be aspiring to? You know, how do we get started even thinking about it? Yeah, I would encourage anybody who's running an uh, operation at the CEO level to also find a board seat independent of what you're doing. And the best way to get started is to, well, you can work with us, of course, but <laughs> to sit down and think about what's the highest and best use of me? Where are my skills? Where are my competencies? Where's my passion? Because it, there's no right answer in this one, but the life cycle of businesses sometimes determine that. I like early stage or I like distressed companies or I like ones that are stuck but need a breakthrough. And understanding where you really want to play is important. And then what industry might be helpful for me to learn more about because it would help me in my CEO job. So sometimes that's going across to a supply chain as opposed to your industry itself, but something that if you worked on a board there, it would make them better to understand your business and you would understand the supply chain better. That's a strategic way of looking at where do you play? Uh, unless, you know, you're really just wanting to do something out of deep, deep, care like a nonprofit organization if you join one of those you do it out of the love 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 of what they're doing and those demand a lot more time than regular boards so you better love it because otherwise you're going to feel imposed upon but any of those opportunities that you do we we do know will make you a better executive great so donna thanks again for joining us today any last parting tips for female entrepreneurs when it comes to thinking about their board? I would say um, you can always reach out to us to learn more about things that you might want to help get some help with. We're also doing um, some programs right now to certify people on boards. There's a new program that we're doing with a women's association out in California that just launched last week. And we're trying to do this with um, sensitivity to COVID. And on so we're doing it interactive, asynchronous on web calls every other Friday so that people can get certified, but also do their lives. 
So those things I think really help, even if it's just to master how you work with your own board, let alone your own professional development for governance. Great. All right, Lionesses, that was uh, Dr. Donna Hamlin from BoardWise. And thank you again so much for joining us today.